please take your seats. We have lots of seats up here. So good afternoon, I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business. Welcome to today's Dean's Speaker Series. It's jointly sponsored by the David Acker Distinguished Lecture Series in Marketing. I am delighted to welcome David Ocker, Professor Emeritus, back to Haas for this yearly event. And today, we are also especially pleased to welcome his daughter, Do Dr. Jennifer Ocker, who joins us today from Stanford's Graduate School of Business, where she's a professor. As many of you are aware, David Ocker is recognized as one of the world's top marketing strategists, and he was recognized in 2015 um, when he was named to the Marketing Hall of Fame. He's known for the widely used Ocker brand identity mo model, which some of you may have already utilized in your studies at Haas. Uh, he's written many books, some of the better known ones I have here. This one, Creating Signature Stories, um, is very well known. Here's another one, um, Ocker on Branding, 20 pr Principles That Drive Success. David, Dave has been on the Berkeley faculty since 1968. He's currently the E.T. Grether Professor of Marketing and Public Policy Emeritus. He also serves as Vice Chairman of Profit Brand Strategies, a San Francisco consulting firm founded by two Haas School alumni um, who were greatly influenced by his teaching and his ideas. Scott Galloway and Ian Chaplin, both MBA 92. Jennifer is a behavioral psychologist, author, and the General Atlantic Professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And uh, she's a very famous professor across the way, and for that reason, I permitted myself today to wear some red, which I never get to do. So I'm very excited. Um, the thing that I really love about Jennifer, other than the fact that she's such a famous um, professor, is she actually received her bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley. Yes. Go Bears. <laughs> um, and she was the professor of the year in Poets and Quants in 2018, which is really amazing. Her current research focuses on the differences between happiness and meaning the power of story in decision making, there's a family theme going on here, and how to build global brands across cultures. Um, she's the recipient of the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award from the Society of Consumer Psychology. She's also co-authored the award-winning book, The Dragonfly Effect. Uh, I am really looking forward to their conversation. Um, I'm really curious to see how they've influenced each other, both personally and professionally. I've actually never seen such an incredibly distinguished father-daughter academic pair before. This is certainly the first time I've ever seen something like this. So please join me in welcoming Professor David Ocker and Dr. Jennifer Ocker. <laughs> And you get great blue shoes on. I just want to let you know that it's offset with the red, the red jacket. It's such a, uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as many of you know, I have such incredible and deep regard um, for the Cal campus and for us in particular, uh, not to mention my dad. Uh, so I wanted to, before we actually um, get into our impromptu Q&A, which will then um, open it up to the audience, I thought I'd give you a few insights uh, into my relationship with my father. First of all, um, here's like a, a few snippets behind the scenes of what actually we talked about in the last few weeks um, before this talk. So here's, here's, a good, here's a good snippet. The only way you could screw this up is by going too long. Don't go too long. So we're gonna keep this pretty short. So, you know, that was a, that was a good insight. 
Um, here's another snippet of, of what, you know, dad says, like, oh, what are you going to talk about? We have this opportunity to be together. And by the way, we've given like four different joint talks because um, we enjoy it so much. And so, and this is kind of a typical back and forth. Dad will say something like, what are you going to talk about? And I'll say, oh, I'm not sure. I'm going to wing it. And then he'll silence. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what happens. Um, and then I thought I'd give you a few um, of the sort of quotes and Dave Ockerisms that I grew up with um, that not only punctuate the present, but certainly um, memorialize the past. You know, when, when I started developing a line of research and, and teaching, dad, I would use dad as a sort of a, um, you know, kind of an advisor, someone to ask questions to. And these would be kind of the, the ideas of what he would express and how he would express them that I think are really important. He and dad, instead of saying like, you know, if someone says like, oh, I want to do something and someone says, huh, he'll say something like, huh? And so that really, you know, shows you should go deeper into a certain research project. And most people say something like, okay, that's a good idea. You know, let's, let's do that for an exchange. And he'll say, okay. And that's when you know, like, not a good idea. Um, and then... Uh, here, he'll say, like, no, I want to do this, and he'll say, no. It, it, but he, the way he's, it comes across is he'll say something like, no, 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 no. So that's, that's the way, you know, Dad and I kind of um, exchange ideas in the, in the Dave Ockerisms that I've grown to love so incredibly much. Um, also, I wanted to share with you three insights on how to be a badass dad before we get started. First... Carve out clear areas of incompetence. The second is to be sneaky. And the third is love always. So let me just give you three quick stories. First, dad taught me uh, the power of being incompetent and, and then declaring that you're incompetent in some area. Um, many women in the room are going, what? I don't understand this. And a lot of the guys in the room, not to be sexist, but this is what I found in empirical research. A lot of the guys in the room are like, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you carve out a couple areas of incompetence? Um, so I have found that there's strong gender differences in terms of how much this resonates with people. But let me just tell you what it means. One, dad, here's dad holding me in, um, in, and this is mom. Say hi, mom. Everyone say hi, mom. Hi, mom. Um, this is mom taking a picture of um, my dad. He um, made it clear that he was not good at changing diapers. Like he tried to change diapers, but he couldn't do it well. And so that was one area of incompetence. A second one is being neat and like, you know, not sloppy. This is dad in the 70s. Um, getting a little messy with some cake. But this had such influence on me because I didn't really feel like I had to be this perfect child, this perfect academic, perfect teacher. And so um, one of the ways that I manifested this clear errors and competence is declaring to my entire family that I could not cook. And I still do not cook. And every now and then when someone asks me to try and cook, I'll almost purposely burn myself and then take a picture of how I burn myself to show everyone how bad I am at actually cooking. So if you want to be a great parent or a great inspiration, I would, I would mention this. To say nothing about the time the fire station was called yeah. to put out the fire yeah, it's true. in the yeah. kitchen. Yeah, I was proud of that moment. Uh, the dinner guests were like, don't worry that the fire engine, you know, the fire, there's two fire engines outside. And I'm like, no, this is a great story. Um, the second one I would say is to be sneaky about things um, and brand things. So one of the most beloved traditions that happened in our house when growing up is these things called special days where my mom would basically, you know, let's face it, do the large majority of the parenting and raising of us. But my dad wanted to make sure that we had some good memorable moments. So he branded these things called special days where he would take me or my two sisters one-on-one -on, -one on a special event. And he'd call it special days and mom would take pictures and then we would do them. And so one was incredibly um, potent, uh, poignant, which is like to go to a cow basketball game and he would get us, you know, pop, popcorn and snacks. It was fantastic. And later on, I realized what were these special days all about, you know? And he said, well, basically, and by the way, th this is, uh, some also empirical research where I asked people, you know, to re remember their happiest childhood memories. Mine, of course, were these special days. And, um, 
And he would say, oh, special days actually ended up being things that I really wanted to do, like go to a Cal basketball game. And you would never want to go. But if I told you we're going on a special day and you didn't know where we're going to go, you would love it. So it was this great way to reframe things. As we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about this research. And the third and the last thing that I'll say about my dad before we start is love always. So I was incredibly um, lucky to grow up in a family that had this culture of abundance and love that you can do anything and you'll be supported forever and always. And um, this was a moment where um, it was a, a particular low moment for me. Actually, I was here at Cal and I went to Paris for a year, which sounds beautiful, but I was very lonely and dad called up one day and he's like, you sound really lonely. Let's meet in England and we'll go shopping. <laughs> so he flew to England and we went shopping, not for good clothes, but for <laughs> actual, you know, colorful clothes. And so um, I wanted to share these three incredibly um, powerful moments that have punctuated my life. And I feel so blessed to have you as my dad. Um, I love you. All right. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's Jennifer said. Yeah. As Jennifer said, this is the fifth time we've done this, and uh, uh, the kind of feedback I get is that I always overshadow her with my charm, instinct, and wit, <laughs> and, and I'm going to tone it down <laughs> so that Jennifer kind of can blossom. Uh, she, she talked about our, our interaction, <laughs> and we have, we have uh, some overlapping interest, or at least uh, there's some things she does that I have an opinion on, and so I, we have this discussion. Sometimes it's pretty intense, and uh, she copes with it in a couple of different ways. Uh, one, she would tell me, you're, you're being repetitious. And uh, uh, an, another thing she says is, uh, well, uh, another thing she does is she just hangs up and says, I got to go. <laughs> and, uh, and then we, I'm suddenly talking into air. And, uh, uh, and, and another thing she does, the ultimate thing she does is she cries. How unfair is that? <laughs> Here you have this argument all teed up, and, and she cries. So anyway, uh, it's, it's, uh, she, she is really uh, fun to be with most of the time, but it's not always, <laughs> it it's, can be a challenge too. So anyway, we're going to have a discussion, right? Yep, we are. Um, so what we thought we'd do is, um, is ask each other, mostly me asking Dad, um, some questions that um, we've given a little bit of thought to. Not <laughs> it's called an interview. Yeah. I, I gave her the script today, and she said, I, I didn't get a chance to read it. I yet. wanted to wing it. Yeah. yeah. That was it. All right, so we're going to start We're gonna start with, do you have an early memory of me? Well, I think that uh, <laughs> this, this ability to, uh, to develop this incompetence perception in, in cooking had an awful start because in high school you you and your sisters had to uh, make a meal each day and you were the star. You your signature dish was quiche, and then I don't you so you had to overcome that early misperception people had. So <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. My classic quiche. Do you guys know that quiche can be served for breakfast, lunch, or dinner? <laughs> so, and if you make it with graham cracker crust, it's like a dessert too. So. Yeah, that was, yeah, so I overcame that. So that's, that's your earliest memory of me? <laughs> Pretty much, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, well, I have to say that you've already given me a list of stories I could not tell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, A, they were uh, not politically correct but funny, or they were pl politically correct but not funny. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're stuck with quiche. Um, all right. So, um, out of all three daughters, which one is your favorite? Oh, I have to say JoLynn because she was the best athlete yeah. in college. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, I liked all of them. Who's your favorite sister? Oh, uh, I really love Jan because you just said JoLynn, so we need to balance that <laughs> out. See. Jan, if you're watching, I love you just as much as Dad loves JoLynn. So we're all just going to align there. 
Um, okay, good. All right, so excellent. Um, what work of yours really bombed? Oh, the, uh, my, my thesis. Uh, I did this uh, stochastic model of consumer behavior where you predict a purchase given a knowledge of the last few purchases. It was, I, it t took five hours of computer time just to, to run the data. And uh, I generated four or five articles that had zero impact on, on any sort of, of, of thought a stream in my field that had zero impact academically and had zero impact uh, uh, in industry. It was the, a very tired topic at the wrong time with the wrong technology. It was awful. Okay, so I didn't know if that's that would. I didn't, so by the way, we have the questions, but I don't know what the answers are because I was going to wing it. But I need to beg to differ on that one. I know I'm going rogue right now. You know right something now. worse? What? A worse article yeah. that I did? Yeah. Is that what you're going to tell? No, I'm just going to tell. So guys, dude, that's like the pinnacle of success in academics that he produced five published papers um, out of one body of work. Um, it's just unheard of. So, um, so let's just all take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Do you have like a work, like a real worst piece? <laughs> that was pretty bad. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's by far the least impact work I've ever done. Okay. Well, anyway, what you're seeing here is that you define best as impactful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Accept that. I mean, it, it, as a minimum, one person had to read it. Okay. Yeah. I'm very excited to go read it <laughs> this evening, so then you can like find a new worst piece, yeah. piece of work. All right, so talk a little bit about your work on branding. How did you get into it? Well, I was in the, uh, gee, this is, goes back 25, 30 years ago, but I was really in the strategy, business strategy. And I wrote a book on it, and I was doing a lot of research on it. And I came to believe that, that firms were too focused on short-term financials and they weren't building assets. So I, in a grandiose sort of inspirational moment, said, I'm going to help people build assets. That's going to be what I do. And then I sort of looked around and said, what assets should I focus on? And I had, uh, coincidentally, had just done a study in which I asked 200 executives, what is your sustainable competitive advantage? And I got a list of 50 of them, and the... Uh, uh, the top one was perceived quality. Uh, the number three was uh, brand awareness. And number 10 was customer base. So three of the top 10 were brand elements. And so I thought, that made sense. So I was going to go into branding. And I had done a lot of work in advertising and market research, and it all supported that. Uh, and your most impactful branding piece? Um, I, well, I guess it'd be my second book, uh, Building Strong Brands, because that was the book that had a, a model I now call the brand vision model to help you actually manage brands and build brands. And the basic idea of the model was that it, it's brands more than a three-word phrase. And at that point, the agencies were really running brands, and they wanted a three-word uh, phrase so they could uh, you know, get an advertising campaign going. And so I said, no, it's, it's six dimensions, 10 dimensions, 12 dimensions, not a three-word phrase. The second thing I said was that uh, we don't know in advance what those dimensions are. You can pick the dimensions that fit your brand and your context. It's not a fill-in-the-blocks model. And a lot of these advertising agencies said, a bunch of boxes, what's your personality and, and what's your uh, benefit? And, so it wasn't a fill-in-the-box model. And those were the two main characteristics of, of this, uh, the model that I put down to, to, to run your brand. Great. Um, talk a little bit. Uh, so by the way, um, when I, so I got my PhD at Stanford and went to UCLA and taught the marketing core class there for a long time. And then when I came back to Stanford, they were kind of desperate for someone to teach brands. So I taught... Um, building innovative brands. Actually, I d did it at UCLA too, but I, I wasn't really overly um, interested in brands. So um, and so I I'm like, oh, what's what's a good book that you've written? And he told me, I think probably the second book, 
But because I didn't do my research because I was winging it. You didn't write it down when no, I told you. No, I didn't you. write it down, no. And so um, I just accidentally assigned his like old first book from 1990. Uh, managing brand equity, which, by the way, is a fantastic book. I haven't read it, or, <laughs> but my students love that book. I just heard it's doing well in China. Yeah, no, I, it's totally visionary. Um, but it, it was interesting. So note that with a caveat. The first book is actually quite good, at least if you ask my students. Um, all right, so a blog on Kraft Heinz. Oh, this is the other fun thing to know about Dad. So he, who follows him on LinkedIn or Profit or Medium or like any of the, his writings? Okay, so a few of you. A recent writing of his um, went what we might call viral. Now, virality is not a strategy, it's a happy outcome, which was uh, an insight that one of my friends, uh, Oren Jacobs, shared with me when I was teaching here at Cal. But can you talk a little bit about how this blog went viral? Oh, th that's a really good question. I'm not. Thank you. It's I'm right not, here. I, so I'm not, I, I, no, that's, <laughs> you, you didn't. No, that wasn't the question, oh. but anyway. Um, uh, a week ago last Friday, uh, Kraft Heinz lost 27% of its stock in one day. And uh, they had a 17, $16 billion write-off. They wrote down brand value. And uh, so I wrote a blog saying that the uh, owners of 3G, which is an outfit in Brazil that believes that strategy is cost-cutting, reducing investment in marketing brands and innovation. And I said, this shows that their method... Uh, is a failure. And, uh, and then I compared it to Unilever that takes the opposite tact, and I compared it to Schlitz Beer, who in the, uh, back in the 70s lost a billion dollars with the same philosophy leading them down the wrong path. And it really uh, struck a chord because there's so many people in marketing that are really apprehensive that uh, 3B and other finance slash accounting slash cost focused people are going to come in and decimate their, their operation and, and their assets. And uh, I had 350 comments, and they were all of that nature. So that, that told me that uh, there's a lot of apprehension out there as to, uh, you know, who's going to, in, in a larger sense, I've talked about this in another book, you know, the capitalism is under attack, and it's not clear if it will survive. And, and and uh, one way it has to survive is to, to, to get away from so focused on short-term financials and do the kinds of things that 3G did to Kraft Heinz. Um, so yeah, it went by 110,000 people uh, saw it in, in just nine days, and that's never happened to me. So it's, it, but, but why it happened is really weird. One reason it happened is because it was right on top of a news item. And so people were interested in that news item and they put in a search engine, Crafter Heinz, and, and then they would get this, this blog entry. So a little side note, one thing that um, I, I admire so much about my dad is not just that he's always been such a pioneer of ideas really on the bleeding edge of a lot of trends and but and crafting the way leaders lead and um, this seminar series is um, a great example of capturing that pioneering thought but the second one is that he has a real sense of responsibility that I think you know um, a, a lot a lot of the leadership here at Haas is really embraced and this idea of thinking about the future of capitalism um, and the future of our world um, is something that that I think you you that seeps into your blood and and you think about every single day. So I I just wanted to say I so how much I, I, admire I, that. Yeah, I wrote a blog called the Sold Capitalism, and uh, and I said who's going to save capitalism, and my answer was it it's, wasn't the business, it wasn't government, it's all of us. It's got to be business and government, but it's also got to be consumers and suppliers, consumers that support companies that have a higher purpose and that, uh, you know, are, are in, the, in, the, in this game for more than just making uh, sales growth and profits. 
Yeah, and I just add on to that. I think also families as an institution, it doesn't matter if it's just your family or if your family has a foundation, um, but I think that that's also another institution of, of potential change in the future. Um, so on that, what do you think is the future of branding or where do you think we're going from, from a branding angle? <clears throat> well, I think that uh, if you, it, branding is, is really in a tough spot. Uh, n not only from the pressure of the three G's of the world, which right now is going pretty well, it's also facing, you know, skeptical and disinterested uh, audiences. It's facing media clutter. It's facing the realities of the visual world. So it's tough. So I think, though, that going forward, the winning brand builders are going to, you know, exercise one or, or more of three strategies. And one is to have a higher purpose, uh, to be in business for more than just making money. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, there's an old story about this guy walking down uh, a road in, in Rome or someplace, and he asked the guy, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm uh, uh, laying bricks, and I'm really good at it. And he, and he asked the next guy a few steps around, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a wall. Look at this wall. And then he asked the third person, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a cathedral. Well, it, it turns out that employees, and especially millennials, they want to work for companies that are building cathedrals. They're not interested in companies that are just laying bricks well. And, and customers, too, want a relationship with an organization they can respect and, and like. And they, too, are looking for something an organization that's that's more than that, and uh, so uh, and, and in addition, this higher purpose gives you a chance to be more interesting, to develop stories that might go viral, that that might get exposure. Whereas, you know, in, in talking about what you make isn't so uh, effective. Second thing is that uh, that customers really aren't interested in your offering, your brand your firm, it's, it's tragic, but it's true. They're just not. And so your inclination to tell them about your offer and your brand and your firm is often a, just a complete waste of time. They'll, they'll ignore it. And if they don't ignore it, they'll probably distort it or, or poo-poo it. And uh, so what do you do then? Well, it turns out that customers are interested in whatever they're interested in. And what you have to do is become an active partner in whatever that is. So take, for example, Sephora uh, uh, Insider, Beauty Insider, or is it, in, yeah, Beauty Insider, it used to be Beauty Talk. And, uh, and what they do is they provide a place where people can go and ask questions about beauty. They can make comments, make recommendations, they can post pictures. And uh, they can interact, especially with people that have the same hair characteristics or skin characteristics. And uh, so you can have a whole group that have dry skin and, and, and what kind of, and greasy hair or something. And, and, uh, uh, and it's not about Sephora or, or products. It's not even about Sephora. It's about beauty. And, and it brings people together. But, they, but as a result of that, Sephora gets so much credibility, so much uh, respect, and so, and so on, and so much visibility that uh, it, it's one of the keys to their success. So that's called a brand community, and that's one way to do that, but there's, there's lots of others as well. And the third thing is that, uh, th and this is going to be the subject of my next book, and it was treated a little bit in my Brand Relevance book, and that is... The only way to grow is to uh, create what I call must-haves that define new subcategories and then uh, manage those subcategories so that they win in the marketplace and create barriers for others so that you are either the most relevant or the only relevant brand in that new subcategory. And if you look, say, at the, uh, the automobile industry, for example, the, uh, the Chrysler minivan, you have uh, uh, Prius, you have Enterprise Rent-A-Car. All three of those companies 
with over 15 years with no competition. Chrysler sold 13 million vehicles in that time period with no competition, none. They had created a subcategory that nobody else was relevant to until finally Honda and Toyota generated CNN and a competitor 15 years later. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, that, that's what I would say that successful branding people are going to go. <clears throat> All right, let's see if I can do this. So I would argue that one reason you're an amazing dad is that he basically raised us with very similar principles. So for example, you know, we actually, um, because we're a fun family, we talked uh, recently about our higher purpose, you know, and so dad recently said, my higher purpose is really to um, support, you know, my girls and my grandkids. Uh, and that's basically kind of it. Like, that's, that's really the thing. And I think a lot of families that do have this higher purpose um, oftentimes have this real clear North Star, and everyone can kind of do their own thing, but also know what's important. Um, the second is, I mean, c talk about co-creating stories and really getting involved in things that um, you weren't even interested in. Uh, even though you were sneaky when we grew up, I also have these <laughs> incredible memories of, you know, I remember... Um, like I, when I was at Cal, I guess, and I was a DG or Megas um, for a little while. Where what you were, where we were, how we got to know. So I tell my DG story. No, uh, let's no. not do that. <laughs> let's just like. But I will. I'll share another similarly embarrassing story. But it's just such a good one to make this point. So I decided that I I should try out for cheerleading. Now, do I have any skill? Absolutely not. I also had that klutzy gene, so um, I would kind of hurt myself when I would try and. Uh, try out, but Dad, he basically went and he he would come to all these football games to sh show like let's study how cheerleaders cheat, che you know, cheer, and then he would try and show me how to cheer. Now, which was comical, but it does make the point. And by the way, I I, I know it's shocking. I never made it, um, but I think it just shows this point of like you would dive into these interests that you had zero talent at. Or interest in, and and but it, it, for that small period of time, it got me to this next phase. And then the third thing um, on these, you know, must haves. I just think that these special days are must have moments that any any individual at work or at home could do. I'm pretty sure I kind of nailed that. Did I nail that? Yeah, yeah, but you, I, you, I think you, I did. I nail that. I think I. I, I think. <laughs> thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're going to switch to stories. Nope, no refuting. I, I think I nailed that. Everyone else agrees. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about stories. How did you get into stories? Well, I got into it because of, of your teaching stories, and and uh, I was always talking to you about you know what is not a story and what is a story, and uh, I, I really you exposed me to the literature, which shows that stories are uh, amazingly powerful. If you if you compare describing a program or giving facts or logic to to embedding those into a story or, or having those motivated by a story, uh, the story a treatment wins not by twenty or thirty percent, by by three hundred percent, four hundred percent. It's just amazing. People remember stories. People are attracted to stories. People are change their perceptions and uh, change their attitudes with respect to stories. And one reason for that is that not only are they uh, uh, interesting and intriguing and involving, but also they, they distract from counter-arguing. So if, if somebody tells you a, uh, a description of the, the Hawes program or something, and uh, you know, not only is it not sufficiently interested to get into it, but you, you counter-argue. You can say, yeah, they're arguing this, but maybe they're just trying to sell me, or, or uh, maybe they haven't uh, compared it to the right thing. You're counter-arguing. It, it, it's just the way it goes. But if a story, you, you don't, it's just a story. You don't counter-argue. So what's your take on signature stories? Well, the, uh, so my goal was to apply stories to um, 
to organizations. And when you and I have overlapped a lot, but you're always focused on, on people or managers or CEOs, and I focus on organizations. And I, uh, you know, I observed that that telling the brand story is really hard for you know all, all kinds of obvious reasons. And so maybe we can use stories to to perform that function to help tell the story. So. So I, I, uh, I sort of define signature stories as a particular kind of story. It's a story that has a narrative, a once in upon a time narrative. Now, if you ask people, what's your brand story? They'll probably give you four bullet points. You know, it has this benefit, it has whatever, this feature. But uh, uh, a story is, you know, uh, you know once upon a time, uh, a Nordstrom salesman took back two used tires because uh, they have a money back guarantee and the customer asked them despite the fact they never had story, never had it. So that's an example of a story that has a strategic message about the, the, the sort of the customer culture of Nordstrom's and their money back guarantee. So it tells that story instead of making that two bullet points, it just tells a story and then you absorb that. And, uh, and the second thing that you need from a story is, is it just has to have a wow factor. It has to pop. You have to say, that is so interesting, I have to tell my friend. It's so humorous, so entertaining, so involving, so intriguing, so uh, inform informative or something that you just have to share it. And, uh, and I've spent uh, a good chunk of time trying to get signature stories used by nonprofits because they usually don't have a big communication budget and uh, and they have stories you know unlike a soap company they have stories and uh, and so you know I sort of expose them to this idea and uh, it's it's even when they sort of accept the premise it's really hard to, for them to implement it and one of the reasons is they say okay a story. Well, and then they give you one one outfit that I'm close to put out the story that was a, a volunteer had gone out and said, you know, I went out and saw this person. He was really nice, and I felt really good afterwards. Well, that's not a story with wow, and uh, you really need uh, that's not helpful, and so it's it's not easy sometimes to generate those. What have you found about applying to apply stories? Well, uh, <clears throat> so I, I actually, how I started, so if you get your PhD, you're basically in, in a lot of fields, certainly ours, you know, dad started in operations and then finished in marketing. And then I got my degree in marketing and psychology. We're trained to only pay attention to data. You're, tra you're literally trained to disregard a story. So if someone shares with you a story, you're not going to pay attention to it or use it as data or decision-making devices unless there's a large amount of data to back that up uh, and to provide color and context. And everything really for me changed about, I guess it was now nine years ago, eight years ago, when I was here at Berkeley. Um, and one of my students, Robert Chotwani, who's an alumni here at Haas, just a brilliant, um, a brilliant thinker, strategist, student at the time, he shared with me at the end of my class a story, not, I asked everyone, you know, what did you learn in the class? It was this creativity and innovation course here. And all of my students wrote to me a few bullets or a list of things. He shared with me a story. It was literally a 40 uh, page uh, slide deck. And that story that he shared with me completely changed my life. It was about his best friend, Samir, who um, had leukemia, was diagnosed with leukemia earlier on in the year. And, um, and what Robert with Samir's friends and family did um, was basically codify and capture the story of Samir so succinctly in two paragraphs and make it so easy for others to share his story and then know what to do in order to hopefully get into the bone marrow registry in order to ideally find a match for, for Samir. And that story that Robert shared at the end of this class with me um, then went on to have a dramatic influence, not just 
on my life, but how I parent, how Andy and I, um, how we spend our time, and what we ended up doing in the, in the next subsequent years. So I guess I think one thing um, that got me interested in story was how much it can ch totally change uh, the trajectory of someone's life if it, if it aligns and if you co-create it with them. And uh, to this day, Robert and I are still very close, and Samir, uh, Samir, Samir's family and, and uh, Andy and I are very close. So anyway, and I think the other thing that I will share about Story is that it's had a real dramatic influence on how I make decisions moving forward. So it um, doesn't matter if it's for work or for um, home. Whenever I ask myself, what is the story or why am I doing this? And, and the story becomes clear, then I actually usually nod my head and do it. But when I don't know the story or why, why am I actually moving ahead and making these decisions, that's when I pause. So that's how I've, I've started to think about story. What's your favorite story about me? Uh, well, I, 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 got, I gave you a list of three or four that you said I couldn't tell. Yeah. What's one that you could tell? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I just come to mind these lists of things I can't tell. <laughs> but I, I should say that, that uh, uh, one thing that's top of mind because it was just brought up was the DG story. I walked into this DG so sorry, sorority it's just embarrassing. and there was no like desks. Oh, and yeah. then I found out that 75% that of the DGs were homecoming queens. Is that disgusting? <laughs> Well, um, it's not as disgusting as many of the other stories he was going to share. So at least that was like a good PG story. Yeah, I didn't sort run of. that by you. Yeah, yeah, I know. You went rogue. Um, talk a little bit about your ideas around the role of digital moving forward. There's certainly digital transformation that's fundamentally shaping how we run businesses um, and also shaping our lives more generally. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, the... Um the subject of my next book is this, uh, you know, you have to really innovate to create new subcategories. And I, I really had a pretty good first draft of this book, you know, last summer, it was last fall. And Jennifer said, you know, there's nothing in here about digital. Duh. And so I had a setback. I was more and, articulate than that. I just want to be very clear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I, I decided to rewrite it and build in digital because if you look at this phenomenon, the, these opportunities to create new subcategories happen rarely. But today, they're happening all the time. And they're, most of them are driven or enabled by digital. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I did a case study of Airbnb. That's going to be an article coming out this, this month. And I, I looked at them as a is an example of how digital works. And uh, it, it's really fascinating. Here's these two guys in an apartment that couldn't pay the rent. So they decided to rent out a, a mattress in their living room. And, uh, and that's how it started. And they were just persistent. In fact, one of the VCs called them like a cockroach. They just never would give up, go away. And uh, uh, it was meant to be flattering, actually. But uh, and, but they stuck with it, they got funding, and then, then they did. The other thing you learn is that it's so important to be perfect in that world. I mean, you can't have a website that, that has a five-second delay. People won't stand for that. You can't have a website that breaks down, every, you know, crashes every few months. They won't stand for that. So you really have to get that right. And, and finally, it's a really great example of how they went beyond functional benefits. Uh, Uber is more of a functional firm, but Airbnb, they have these host entrepreneurs that uh, go out of the way to, to make the guests feel really special. And the guests uh, are, uh, they, they attract guests that really are out for adventure, but they still want a human content, and they deliver that in a really awesome way. Well, we, we, we're, we really want to leave time for some Q&A, but tell me a little bit about your AI stuff. 
Did you guys see how seamless that transition was? That was good. Segway. I really yeah, liked it. Yeah, I'm not good at segues. No, it was great. It was good. Dad and I share a lot of commonality, but one of them is we're not good at transitions, nor are we good at saying, like, goodbye. We just, like, hang up on each other. And, but it's done with love. What do you mean we? we? We both do this. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, so... I didn't know that. Yeah, we did, yeah. <laughs> um, so I teach her right now, in fact, uh, this week, uh, a class called Designing for AI. Um, and, the, and the real focus is on how do you cultivate or build toward human well-being. Um, so how do you think about human well-being at the individual level and also at the aggregate level? What's really interesting is right now we're living in a time where there's so much uh, Disruption, but if you think about other sort of technologies that have disrupted our lives, you know, I'm just thinking like in, the, in 1850, um, I think it's something around 80 or 90 percent of uh, the U.S. was in agriculture, which went to 40 percent in 1900, and now it's two percent, right? So that's just massive change. Uh, in in uh, 1950, 30 percent of our labor force was um, in, in areas of, um, of uh, uh, manufacturing. Right now we're 10%, and that's just in the last, you know, sort of 60 years. And so that's been uh, a significant shift as well. And my, um, one of the things that we've been doing in this class is start to understand what are the implications of these massive shifts and, and looking at, from a historical perspective, what's happened from a short-run perspective in a long run perspective from a job displacement perspective. And so in this particular class, we start to think about, A, what are the implications for human well-being with digital transformation upon us? Um, a second thing is, as we start to think about AI or machine learning and the algorithms that drive it, um, how might we think about building those algorithms to actually allow individuals to thrive. And if you look at how we make choices right now, a lot of times we are making choices based on optimizing sort of short run happiness. Um, and a lot of the work that I do is focused on um, understanding what long-term happiness looks like. So with a lot of other behavioral psychologists and economists and sociologists, we start to map out how do you make sort of decisions and help make in, help individuals make decisions for long run happiness, not just maximizing what feels good right now? And so, and then another piece of this class is really to focus on how do you use AI to augment and complement humans rather than think about sort of displacing humans. And what does that look like? How do we want to live our lives and uh, spend our time in ways that allow us to thrive? And then how do you use um, digital technology to think about helping that? And so many of you are thinking about you know, the future of work or how do you want to spend your time? And, and, and the question is, how can we use technology in order to maximize for long-term human well-being? That's great. Can you say a word also about your humor book, upcoming book? Yeah, another great question. Um, and so I also teach a class on humor called Humor Serious Business and um, a related one called A New Type of uh, Leader Anchored on Purpose Fueled by Humor. And both of these classes are taught with Naomi Bagdonis. And what we found, and actually um, it goes back to Berkeley, when, um, so I'll, I'll regress a little bit and then I'll answer your question. So when I was here at Berkeley for two years, uh, teaching this creativity and innovation class, and I was so inspired by Robert Chantwani's story, we went out, Andy and I, uh, my husband and I, went out and wrote this book called The Dragonfly Effect. And um, we thought it was sort of boring just to like try and support a book. So we never asked any individual to buy the book, but we just said it's a roadmap of making social change if you want to. How do you harness the power of story and social networks to make change happen? Uh, instead, what we thought was interesting was actually could we put it to work? And so we took one year and we kind of really decreased research and decreased making money for that year and all sorts of things. And we, we tried to work with our kids and um, some students to see if we could get more people in the bone marrow registry in that one year using the Dragonfly model. And so Samir, Robert's best friend, passed on. 
uh, at the end of, of this class. And in the, in the spirit of, of creating legacy for him and hopefully helping other individuals that might not have resources make positive change in the world, Andy and I took off that year and worked with some students to see if we can get 100,000 people on the Bowen Mayor Registry in honor of Samir. And in that time, we ended up working with, I believe it was 18 families and um, 17 of the, the kids in those families, in some cases the parents, that had bone marrow um, cancer or blood cancer, leukemia, they all died. So we worked with them intimately and they all passed on. And only one of them out of all of the families we worked with in that year survived. And his name is Amit Gupta. And he's one of the funniest and most fun people that I've ever met. That when he got his network working to try and find a match in the bone marrow registry or get more people in the bone marrow registry to find him a match, um, they did so with, with so much levity and fun. They would run um, bone marrow drives and they would have parties. And it was just incredibly delightful and engaging. And that sense of levity made it so much easier to um, move forward in very grave circumstances. So after that year, I, I went to like a little bit of a lull. I, I actually got quite depressed about our impact and our in, ineffective impact in that year because we weren't able to help so many families. But, um, but I learned a lot in that process. And I did, I feel like I learned that the power of humor um, the, uh, really helped us make change happen. And I think that it's, the, it's really the balance of gravity and levity that gives power to both. And that's what got me really interested in understanding the behavioral science of humor, what happens when people laugh. Um, and not only did it inform a lot of our research, uh, we started teaching these two very, I think, important classes. Um, and we'll have a book out in a, a year's time. And um, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. And I have to say, the last thing I'll say, and I guess we'll open it up for Q&A, is the way in which how much laughter um, like, um, sits with me when I think of stories of us um, growing up with you and mom. It's really quite remarkable. I don't remember any challenge that we had where we weren't able to eventually laugh at it. So, um, yes. So anyway, I love you. And maybe we could open it up for questions. Yeah, is there time for any questions? Or are we done? Did we use up all our time? Yeah. Um, in, in today's world, I feel like there's an infinite amount of like places and times where advertisers can advertise and reach us. I think kind of an equal amount of like brands that are trying to reach us. Um, there seems like there's a thousand bikini brands, sunscreen brands, just clothing brands out there. So how do you recommend kind of going into the workforce today, maybe like creating our own brands, um, differentiating that? Like well, one of the things I've studied uh, by writing these new chapters, thanks to Jennifer, is uh, how e-commerce companies compete with Amazon. And just to give you an example, the Dollar Shave Club has three options for razors, and they now offer a toothbrush. That they have one option, you can get two actually, white or black. Uh, Amazon, if you go on Amazon, there's 4,000 different toothpaste, toothbrush options, and there's something like 12,000 different shave options. And so uh, one of the ways these new e-commerce companies win in the marketplace against Amazon is that they make that choice for you. And so you don't have to be inundated with all, that, all those choices. And they also do other things like they create a personality. And like Dollar Shave Club is a good example. They add humor. And they got a lot of humorous stuff that goes along with them on their website and they, they send a little magazine with each shipment that's humorous. Um, but anyway, cutting down the choice is one. Oh my God, that was so good! <laughs> so, Meg, is it okay if we like go on the back and mingle informally? Okay, so we're going to go back and mingle informally, but thank you guys all so much for coming. We appreciate it.
Thanks, Jennifer. That was terrific. Thank you. That was so fun. I used up my story at the beginning, and so I didn't have any stories.